Basically, he's firmly decided that. And two things that he communicates a couple of times is you need to go and tell them what I say to say. Like, go tell them what I'm saying, whatever I command you. And the second thing is, I will be with you and will rescue you. Now, the interesting thing about that, he, he does not say, I'm going to keep you from trouble. In fact, you realistically, like he's saying, you're, you are literally the resistance against the wrongdoing of entire nations. Do you think he'll come into trouble? <laughs> yes, absolutely. In fact, he said, they will fight against you. So what does he promise? He doesn't promise to keep him out of trouble. What he promises is, I will rescue you and save you. I'll be with you to rescue you and save you. So when you need it, I'll step in. But this is like a perfect scenario to set up the different seasons in life. Because he just got an amazing calling, and he got the trouble to go with it. So do you think that we're going to see the ups and downs of life through something like this. Absolutely. And you should expect the same. You should expect the same. In Jeremiah 15, 15 chapters into this, this is where I would say that Jeremiah is in a winter season. And what he says is, he's talking to the Lord, he says, when your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, O Lord God Almighty. I never sat in the company of revelers, Never made merry with them. I sat alone because your hand was on me and you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unending and my wound grievous and incurable? Will you be to me like a deceptive brook, like a spring that fails? Okay, so Jeremiah acknowledges himself that he went from a place of where when he received the word of the Lord, it was his joy and his heart's delight. And now he is in a place where he's like, it's awful, and it keeps going, and it's not getting any better. I I would say that's a shift in seasons. It's awful. It's not getting any better. He's playing the victim. In fact, he says to the Lord, will you be to me like a deceptive brook? You said you'll be with me. In other words, he's saying, you said you'd be with me but are you going to be like when I would go to a spring and I want some water and it's just going to be dry? Are you actually going to show up in the promise that you said to me? So one of the biggest conditions of being a victim is that you think that you're you're stuck in your thinking, first of all, and I can say this from experience of playing the victim plenty of times in my own life. You're stuck in your thinking it can't get any better, and you think you have no choice. And that's exactly what he's saying. He's saying it's not getting any better, it won't get any better, and you're just leaving me. So the Lord responds with this. He says in verse 19, Therefore, this is what the Lord says, If you repent, I will restore you, that you may serve me. If you utter worthy, not worthless words, you will be my spokesman. Let this people turn to you, but you must not turn to them. I will make you a wall to this people, a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you. For I am with you to rescue and save you, declares the Lord. So the first thing that the Lord responds with is, you have a choice. If you repent... I'll restore you. And what, does he, and what does he say to encourage him to make that choice? He tells him all of the same promises that he told him in the very first time. I will be with you and will save you. They'll fight against you, but will not overcome you. I'll make you a fortified wall of bronze, a wall to these people. He says all of the same things that he said to Jeremiah when Jeremiah received them, and it was his heart's delight and his joy. The same things. He didn't tell him something new that might change his mind, because where was the break here that had set him in a winter season? And, and let me just say this on a side note. Not all winter seasons are because of our dumb choices. 
hard things happen in life. So I'm not trying to be insensitive to that. But a lot of my winter seasons have been become of dumb choices. <laughs> so the break is there. And the Lord's saying, I'm giving you a choice. And he tells him all the same things that he said in the very first time that he met with Jeremiah. Because really the question that he's asking is, will you believe me again? Will you believe me again? Because that's what Jeremiah lost sight of. Because now he wasn't sure if the Lord would be with him and rescue him. He even challenged the Lord. He said, will you show up when I need you? The first thing that the Lord got across to Jeremiah was, you have a choice. If you repent, I'm not going to make you. If you repent, I will restore you. Because restoration is the summer season. When things have come back to be. But what gets you to restoration from the winter season is repentance. And repentance is a change in thinking. And you know, it's not always this uh, perspective that we have of like, you're wrong and you need to change that. Though that happens. Sometimes God's like, hey, will you look at this differently than you've been looking at it? He doesn't even have to say you're wrong to lead you in a direction that's right. Sometimes he does, if we need to hear it. But if he's going to ask the question, do you want to believe it again, there has to be a change in thinking. For Jeremiah, Jeremiah would have to repent. He would have to literally choose to set his thinking back on those same promises that God gave him 15 chapters earlier. The same ones. I shared a couple of weeks ago when I, uh, at the end of service after Mark shared about a winter season the win- what happens in the winter season defines the landscape of the following summer. Like, we're getting snow right now, and is that going to make a difference in what our summer looks like? Absolutely. Thank God. Thank God. The same is true in the seasons of our life. The choices we make in the winter season and the things we step into new thinking will change everything about our summer season. Because new thinking, you know, I shared this a couple weeks ago too. We are only as stuck as our thinking is. Let me put that in a different context or in a different way. If your thinking can't move from where you are right now, you can't move from where you are right now. If your thinking can't move from where you are right now, you can't move from where you are. That's the hard work of faith. Because what God is, is encouraging Jeremiah to do is to believe the same promise that he had 15 chapters ago and that he's being reminded of now to believe that same promise so that he can see restoration come at a later time. It's a, it's a question of faith. Will you believe it again? Will you believe it again? Because Repentance leads to the summer season of restoration. Restoration is when everything has come back around. It's when, in, in a sense, um, just to throw out a few describing points, it's not yet when you're going to find harvest, but it's like you've, you've planted those seeds, you've put the hard work of faith to not see a tangible thing, and now, because of that hard work, you're beginning to see tangible things. And you're encouraged. And you're like, yes, this is where I wanted to see things going. Things are being restored in your life, in the area around you, in everything. In your circumstances, but most of all, in your heart. It's literally, like with Jeremiah, it was the issue of coming from where he was, being very honest about his doubt. And about how awful he felt and saying it would never end and it's not getting any better, and it grieves me. 
The Lord just brings it back to where it was his joy and heart's delight. How can one word, remember, he gave Jeremiah the same promises. How could it one time bring joy and heart's delight and the other time bring doubt and grievous and incurable? A matter of faith. Your choice. He wants to restore joy and heart's delight out of those promises. You know, the interesting thing about the summer season and a season of restoration, it's not that it's necessarily an easier season. In fact, sometimes it is dramatically more demanding. It just seems easier because you're working from restoration rather than question, doubt, and insecurity. You're just working from a place of restoration, so everything seems easier. When you're asked to do things like to tear down and overthrow, to build and to plant, you feel like you can do it because you're whole. That's why it seems easier. I can think of plenty of times, for me personally, like, honestly, as a roofing contractor, like, winter was actually, like, I hated working outside in the wintertime uh, with the snow and the ice and all that. But in all reality, it was like a break compared to the summer season. Because summer, we were so busy that we couldn't just sit back and relax. I couldn't sleep in or have extra quiet time. I didn't have those margins. Winter was like the easiest season for me in a certain sense. Summer is not always the easiest season. It just seems easier because we're working from a completely different operating place. When you work from restoration, you're working from something substantial, your best self, and where your best self is going. Your joy and heart's delight is your strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Do you think it's any accident that it says it like that? No. The picture that I get, it's really the season of restoration is like the season of your life that is the glory of your life as God intended it at that point in time. It's like the glory that he intended for your life at that point in time. That's why it says we go from glory to glory. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. In other words, when you stand in a mirror, the work that he's doing from that repentance to restoration to repentance to restoration process, that cycle of seasons in your life is bringing you more and more in his image where you're shining that glory. When you even look in the mirror, you shine the glory of the Lord. It's not just you because something is being built in you and being done in you that's substantial. You know how it said about um, Caleb? It talked about Caleb in the Old Testament. It said, but Caleb had a different spirit. You know, the word for different there was actually a plural. Basically, he had two spirits living within him, his own and the Holy Spirit. Because there was work being done through processes, through cycles, through repentance and restoration, just like in all of us. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that God intends his promises to bring you joy and delight or frustration, doubt, insecurity? It's a stupid question, right? In a certain sense, but at the same time, what does it mean to you right now? What does it mean to you right now? Because if it's not joy and delight right now, my guess is he wants to take you back to joy and delight. And he may not give you any incentive outside of the words he's already said to you, the promises he already gave you, that he's just asking, will you believe it again? Will you believe it again?
from my experience at least, it seems that the kingdom builds within us upon season after season after season from glory to glory until it's literally just like so deep. With it. It's such a part of who we are. It's, it's like it's built a fortress within our own being. Not the fortress that keeps people out, but the fortress of strength. The restoration that you operate from where things seem easier. Because it is easier. You know, I'm, there's this like, in the back of my head, there's this really obnoxious truth that uh, I think of quite often. Um, have you ever heard this, that um, it's only as hard as you make it? It's a very obnoxious truth. But it is. Let me put it this way. I have not found it untrue in my life. It's interesting, when the Lord has asked me to repent or change my thinking about something, usually what he's asking me, if I sit back and think about it, is something very simple. Very simple. Why is it so hard sometimes? Because it's a step of faith and because I'm stubborn. It's only as hard as I make it. What he's asking is very simple. It's my mind is in two places when it's hard. It doesn't have to look like that. Why does it have to be a certain way? It doesn't. But if our thinking can't change from here, we can't change from here. If our faith and what we believe about God cannot grow from where we're at right now, our relationship with God will not grow from where it's at right now. That's why he wants to keep bringing it to restoration after restoration and keep defining that process because there's a lot at stake for him too because he wants you. That's his prize. It's a good motivation to believe it. He wants you. This dynamic showed up really true for Jeremiah. In uh, Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 8. And we know that Jeremiah repented after all of that because there's still like another 37 chapters in the book of Jeremiah. <laughs> right? But five chapters later, he's having a hard time again. And so, but this, this is what I love about him. He's so honest. He's very honest to God. He's even like, I don't like you right now, in a sense. <laughs> But I respect you, and, you know, and he speaks probably more respectful than I just did there. But Jeremiah 20, verse 8 says, So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Going from glory to glory does things within, there's no doubt in my mind that the Lord knows how to win the heart of a man. Going from glory to glory does such work in your own being that it becomes a point that you cannot detach from what it is. I forget exactly what other uh, prophetic books it says, it could be more than one. But basically, the Lord says to his people, I will cure you of your backsliding. I'm going to paraphrase it. But by inspiring you to fear me and to respect me. I will cure you of your backsliding by inspiring you to fear me and respect me. That's what this process does. It makes such a deep place in your heart that you cannot let it in. Like Jeremiah is like, as much as I would love to quit this at times, that's not a good idea for me or for anybody else. That won't work. You know, this process really hasn't changed all that much. I'm gonna kinda finish up with some things to leave you with something to think about and ponder and ask the Lord about. I'm not gonna give you a, a specific conclusion out of it. But in the New Testament, in the book of John, chapter one, verses one through five, in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everyone that was cre- everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Okay, when I was looking into this, the word, as it's called right there in that set of scripture, in the Greek, the original word for the word is the spoken word in context of God, the spoken word of God. And we know that's talking about Jesus. Now, in Jeremiah's calling, in the beginning of Jeremiah, when, I, when God touched Jeremiah's mouth and gave him his words, that original Hebrew word is also the spoken word of God. In two different, this is just to ponder and question and think about. But in two very different languages, a long time apart, the process that it talks about how God comes in to meet the heart of a human being is through the spoken word. To bring light and life, joy and heart's delight. It brings the same things, it has the same processes. This is nothing new. A lot has changed, but he's doing the same things. And what takes place in your heart and gets established in the depth of your soul from going from repentance to restoration, the summer season, settles something so deep in your heart that it becomes like a necessity. Jeremiah's like, it's it's a part of me. I can't deny it. Do you know how God shows up relevant to a world that does not believe in him? By becoming a necessity to someone who does believe in him. He shows up relevant to a world that does not believe in him by becoming a necessity to someone who does believe in him. That's how it works. Think about it. If he's not a necessity to you, Why would he be relevant to the people around you? Why would he seem relevant? Another way to look at it, and and the conviction that I was challenged with, if if I am not amazed by what God has done in me, they won't be either. If I'm not amazed by what God has done in me, they will not be either. That was a very hard challenge to receive that did a lot of work in my heart. I want to uh, I want to give you guys this encouragement in going forward today. If you are in a winter season let me put it this way. Let me start with this. If you're in a summer season I don't mean for it to be like such a devious clap, but (laughs) congratulations. Will you please come and encourage me and anyone else who may not be in a summer season? Will you share out of the restoration, from the restoration of your own heart, what we need who are not there right now? To those who are in a winter season, Perhaps the only question that you need to be thinking about right now that I'm going to propose is, will you believe it again, what he said to you in the first place? Because it may be that his encouragement to your faith is the same thing that he told you over and over and over again. Really what he's asking is, will you believe it again? Because his purpose is to bring you to restoration within your being. Your joy and heart's delight depend on it. And I think his does too, in a certain sense of saying it. So I'm going to pray over you guys that, Lord, 
you would make all of the people here aware of the season that they are in. And not let them prolong a winter season by being closed-minded in their faith and choosing not to believe what you say. Encourage us all in the strength we need to believe further than our capacity right now about who you are and what you say. There is no reason for us to believe less. Do not stop short of encouraging us in this, Lord. But let us hear from you in the season that we're at. And if we are in that summer season, Lord, then then inspire us to just milk it and milk it and give thanks and give thanks and give thanks until all the good stuff is just running out. And if we're in that winter season, let us be challenged. And if we're in that spring season and we're planting the seeds of new thinking, then give us insight, give us wisdom, and give us hope. And if we are in the fall and we're in a time of harvest, then let us enjoy every little bit of it and give thanks to you and let it be the seed that gets us through that next hard season and make us aware of where we are that we could honor you no matter what and be grateful for where we are. Thanks for being so good to us. Thank you that what you care about is our joy and heart's delight that you are the light and life to all men and women. Amen.